Right, so this lecture will actually be done in two parts. Myself and Teon Morris will be your tutors for this lecture. So I'll be doing lecture one and Teon will do lecture two. I think lecture two is either tomorrow or on Wednesday. And again, I just want to reiterate that the topic is climate change and metabolism. So I look at session. So let me just introduce myself. So I'm Lenika Roden. I am the camp director. We would have met on the very first day of camp, but you would have interacted mostly with your tutors and coordinators. And so um, this might be the first time we're having a class together. So fun fact about me is that uh, even though I, my background is in marine biology, I am extremely afraid of fish. And I'm actually a certified diver, but still, I am very afraid of fish. So that's a fun fact. So if you want to share, if you're inclined to share, please share a fun fact about yourself. You can post it in the chat and I'll definitely go through it uh, while I go through the lecture. So let's just look at the global environment. So we understand that um, the global environment, as we know it, is really changing over time. There are changes in temperatures, there are changes in different processes that are happening around us. And these changes actually affect the structure and functioning of ecosystems. And we know what ecosystems are, right? Any bright person want to just give a definition of ecosystems? And just open your mic and blurt it out. No, anybody want to type the definition in the chat? Let's see if I can get the chat up. So nobody knows the definition of ecosystems. I'm not seeing anything in the chat and nobody is opening their mics. No, are you guys shy? I don't know. I was, I was speaking, but my mic was off. Okay, go ahead. I was, yes, I was saying that an ecosystem is basically um, a group of interacting organisms, right. a community. Of, yeah. Awesome, not bad, not bad. I know I'm seeing somebody posting in the chat. Ariana, place where organisms live. Correct, you're all right. So basically, the complex and interacting biological and physical processes in an ecosystem make the fact that the environment is changing a problem. Because if the environment is changing, the environment which we call home, if it's changing, then that means these interactions, these relationships that exist in ecosystems will basically face a threat. So for example, their feeding relationships, their mating relationships, and there are other kinds of relationships where it says that organisms just live together and share a home together. And if it is that the environment is changing, it might affect the survival of another organism. It might affect the ability of another organism to move as fast as it used to. And so, because for example, if the place is too hot, right um even a lion can get tired and can become drained easily so maybe uh you know before the climate started to change or the global environment started to face any major changes the lion would have been able to run down the what is it that lions eat do the lions eat cheetahs no maybe so all right, so let's yeah, see. I think they hunt cheetahs and eat like their liver and stuff like, like their insides and leave like the skin out. I think I'm not 100% sure. 100% sure. sure. Okay, awesome. So let us say, for example, that the lion is usually hunts a cheetah. Um, 
But then there are some changes in the temperature. Let's say the place just started to get severely colder. And, you know, lions are, most, are mostly adapted to deserted areas, areas that are really dry. And so now the lion would see the cheetah, but he cannot spend so much energy to run down the cheetah because he has to use and conserve that energy for shivering because the place is cold. So these are the kind of changes that will happen. So let's just look at the ocean. So the ocean, as we know it, it absorbs most, and you know, in brackets, we have the exact figure, 93% of the heat generated by greenhouse gases emissions. Right, so the, the ocean absorbs all of that heat and uh, it basically causes an increase in sea surface temperature of one to 10 degrees over a period of time, really long period of time, 100 years. So the ocean also absorbs carbon dioxide released in the atmosphere from anthropogenic sources. And if you don't know what anthropogenic means, it means human activities, right? So if you want to add it to your vocabulary, anthropogenic sources or anthropogenic factors are human induced or human activities, right? So the ocean basically traps all of this heat and it often affects the chemistry of the ocean, the heat in terms of the surface temperature, and also it can affect the acidity of the seawater because if this ocean is absorbing car carbon dioxide, it can mix with other chemicals and create a very acidic environment. So if it is that organisms live in the ocean, right? And all of these things are happening and the when we look at the global environment again, the temperatures are increasing. And of course, with anthropogenic activities, which of course are factors that accelerate climate change, can you just imagine what is happening to the organisms that live in the sea? Can you imagine living in the sea and then all of a sudden everything is, is becoming more acidic, the temperatures are rising and you don't know what to do because this is where you live. It's not like you can jump up out of the sea and start to live on land, which and land isn't even better because on land it is just as hot. So the shorty, I mean the shorty sun. So it can be cold, uh, so it can be cold. Uh. Ah. But then it will be cold. Excuse me, Miss. Hi. Miss, what are we doing? We're learning about climate change and metabolism. Miss, I have a theory. Okay. About, I, it's about like, what I think is that if we keep on going the rate, we are doing now affecting climate change and and every decade the degrees the it rises by five degrees i think and yes that's true and in that means in our the next hundred years the earth might rise up 500 degrees Quite possibly, even though it, it won't necessarily uh, increase at that rate. But yes, you're pretty correct. In a hundred years, if it's every decade as it increases by five degrees in a hundred years, it would be 50, 50 rather than 500. But you are correct though. So it is, it is alarming, which is why we are placing such a high degree of focus on climate change, because we wanted to understand just how serious 
the effect of climate change is. I don't know if you would have experienced it, but the summers are getting hotter. And so what this slide is basically saying is that while it is on land, we're experiencing the, the, the changes as it regards to heat and temperature. In the ocean, the organisms have to deal with the carbonic chemistry, the acidity of the seawater, the sea surface temperature rises, and all of those other um, factors. And one might ask, why is it that the organism don't swim up to the poles to find much you know, cooler water or warmer water? But it's not as easy as you think, you know, because once it is that the ocean starts to heat up, and when you look at the fact that the pole, the polar ice is is meant is melting, you know, you really have to wonder if if it is that the ocean, in and of itself, there are some changes that may just happen to all the the different organisms that live in the ocean itself. So, in addition to ocean warming and acidification. Of course, we understand that human indoor stressors are decreasing the concentration of dissolved oxygen and consequently expanding oxygen minimum zones. So what this really means is that because of the fact that the sea surface temperatures are rising and because of ocean acidification, because remember the ocean is also absorbing carbon dioxide. And remember that we've always been advocating for us to, to use, for example, to be greener, for us to use um, electric items rather than using gas and contributing to the high levels of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. So because the ocean absorbs all of this CO2, which is carbon dioxide, it affects the acidification of the ocean. And once the acidification, once the ocean becomes more acidic, it can affect the concentration of dissolved oxygen. So even though organisms live in the ocean, we know that they all still breathe oxygen, right? We, we all understand that, correct? Yes, yes, okay, awesome. And so if the amount of oxygen that is dissolved in the sea, in the ocean itself, is affected by acidification and ocean warming, and because of climate change and all the activities that humans are doing, producing high levels of carbon dioxide, that means that the ocean is being tremendously affected and the organisms in the ocean is struggling to find oxygen even as we speak. And so when they say that it is expanding the oxygen minimum zones is that more and more places in the ocean, so where organisms used to live, there are places in the oceans that you go now where you would want to see fish, you can't see fish there anymore because fishes cannot survive in that environment because it is considered an oxygen minimum zone. Organisms don't thrive in oxygen minimum zones. They can barely survive because that means that oxygen is at the minimum level. And if there are too many fish in this particular environment or part of the ocean, there will be problems. And what happens if you can't breathe? What happens if an organism can't get enough oxygen to survive? You suffocate. You suffocate suffocate and die correct so these environmental changes has a profound impact on the community so let us look at climate induced changes so generally recognized predictions regarding climate induced changes on the composition and distribution of the marine biota include shifts in the species distribution from lower to higher altitudes. So I think Justin mentioned something similar to this, where it is that organisms can move from somewhere where the water is warm and move to you know cooler areas, probably to, to establish, re-establish that balance. 
So that can happen. And this is all, always climate induced changes. So what this slide is basically speaking to is the fact that, you know, because climate change is happening, this happens as a result. And so the two main changes that we should focus on is the composition of the marine community and the distribution. Composition meaning the different species. So what, what are we seeing? Parrotfish, sprat, jack, all these other types of fishes um, living together. Um, and then distribution would be where it is that we're seeing these organisms. And remember, we just um, spoke about the oxygen minimum zones increasing. And so if they're increasing, that means you'll find organisms in less areas across the, the ocean floor, basically, in areas where they can access um, oxygen. And that would mean that they would be moving from areas of lower altitudes to higher altitudes, because that is where um, the place is much cooler and not as hot and therefore the waters might not be as acidic. And so oxygen might be more read readily available in higher altitudes, in higher latitudes, sorry. So there's a shift also from near surface to deeper waters. So, and fishermen will tell you this. So um, I don't know if any of us know fishermen, do we live in a community where, where we've seen fishermen or when we go to the beach, do we see fishermen? When you see a fisherman the next time, you can go to him and ask him, how easy has it been to catch fish? Because of climate change, the fish are now moving from being at the surface of the water to swimming to much deeper waters, right? You usually find the, the, the fish closer to the shore. Sometimes when you go to the beach, you might see a fish or two, occasionally. But now- what miss, this is miss. Yes, go ahead. If the fish go to deeper waters, the pressure might um, make them implode, I guess. Not necessarily. So because, and sometimes they don't have any choice. They don't have a choice really, Jermaine. So sometimes the case is that the fish is just trying to find oxygen because near surface, the temperature is high, the water might be extremely acidic. And so oxygen accessibility is extremely low. And so they have to swim to deeper waters. The pressure might be too much for, 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 for some of the fish, but they, they're able to adapt in a sense, or they, they try to find a bala, an area that they can manage to survive in at least. But usually, but that this, is, this is the shift that is happening basically. They're moving from near surface to much deeper waters Okay, miss. Right. And another point is that there's also a decline in calcifying species. Anybody know what I mean by calcifying species? Naming species. Justin, repeat that. Naming new species. No. So calcifying in terms of calcium. Calcium. Yes. So what, what kind of organisms in the ocean has um, outer body or outer shell made with calcium? Coral. Correct. What, what, what other organism? Our body. Oh, what? Why you say that again? Calcifying species, meaning species that has their outer body or outer shell made of calcium. Sea urchins. Right. All right, so we're, we're, on, we're on the right track. So there might be a decline in calcifying species. And of course, you know, like our, our shrimp and all those others with the, with the outer shell that's made of calcium as well. And, you know, the reason for this is because because of the change in the chemical composition of the ocean, it is much more difficult for these organisms to calcify. So the word is right there, it's C-A-L-C-I-F-Y-I-N-G, that's calcifying. So when you see that word, calcium should come to mind. 
all right? And then there might also be increases in the, ab in the abundance of warm water species. Right, so you might see species that are better able to adapt to warmer waters. You might see an increase in those types of fish, call them tropical um, fish. So there are models that actually suggest that the response of biological communities to climate change assume a fixed or, genet or genetically determined environmental niche for each species. And I'll explain that shortly. And the migration of intact populations. So basically their distribution on our future planet is basically governed by the environmental conditions. So what it is saying is that the response of communities, ecosystems to climate change, it's, it's, it kind of assumes a fixed or genetically determined environmental niche for each organism. So basically it is wherever an organism can survive based on their species type. So if we're humans, there are certain, there are certain living criteria or conditions that we can survive in, correct? And so we would go where it is that these criteria are met. So for example, they say that there are some planets that humans cannot survive on. Can we name any of these planets that humans cannot survive on and say why? Jupiter's moon. And why can't we survive on those planets? Because they don't have the resources to, to live. Right. And, and those resources would, of course, include oxygen and other kinds of gases that, would, that we would need, even gravity, that we would need to sustain life. Jupiter? Yes, correct. Uranus? Yes. <laughs> All right. So basically, that is what it is saying. And it's also saying that the distribution of organisms on our planet, especially as it pertains to the fu our future planet, it is governed by the environmental condition. So it depends on how it is that a particular area would change in terms of the temperature, and and all the other factors that come this, into play. Yes. This one, there are a few planets that we can live on. Okay, and what are those planets? Eco planets. Sorry, I forgot their name. I think they're there's. I forgot their name their name, sorry. Okay, so when you remember the names, can you drop them in the chat for us? So we can call them. The name well? is the same for every planet. Okay. It's just that they have different letters and numbers. Oh, whoa, all right. I will be sure to look that up. So just they're to called, close. They're called exoplanets. Okay, can you, exoplanets. can you also type that in the chat for us? Planets. All right, thank you. So just to conclude what this slide is saying, or just to close, is that while it is that these changes are happening and you know, these changes are causing the organisms to move to different places to find favorable conditions. There are instances where local populations may actually evolve a climate and adapt to environmental changes. So evolve meaning that they adopt new ways of living. For example, if it is that they used to feed on a particular organism that no longer exists because the heat because of increases in temperature, so that organism no longer resides in that area, then maybe that organism might decide that, okay, I'm going to start feeding on something else so that I don't have to move because the heat isn't really bothering me. Or they might choose to acclimate. So what this means is that um, they just adjust to the climate itself 
So they're used to having a very cold, um, they're used to being in a very cold climate and the place is getting much warmer. So in this instance, when they, acc when they acclimate, it means that they're just adjusting to the heat. Um, it might be that they're shedding some fur so they don't have as much fur so that they, they are not as hot, right? So that helps them to adapt to the environmental changes. And so you might see cases where the organisms are not necessarily moving, but instead they are choosing to evolve a climate and adapt. So let us move to looking at climate change in and of itself. So we understand the fact that climate change is altering ecosystems by shifting distributions and we just talk about the phenologies. So phenology means it speaks to their, their physical characteristics, right? So we just spoke about them shedding some fur if the place is too hot. Um, or for example, if it is that they were living in a very hot area and the place started to get cold and snow start falling and all of these things, then that organism might start to grow some fur. So that helps to keep them cool, right? So that is changes, changes in physical characteristics. And of course, another impact of climate change is the interactions among species. So we just spoke about an example about a feeding relationship where it is that an organism might have been feeding on another organism and maybe that organism that they were feeding on that organism's population has been affected by climate change. So they no longer reside in the area. So that feeding relationship would have ended because the organism would have migrated to another area. So the other organism, organism A cannot feed on the other organism again. So they would have to find another organism to feed on or probably possibly like a, another plant or, or something of that sort. But it's very important for us to understand how these changes are caused by climate, climatic influences on physiology and fitness. And to be honest with you, it continues to be a challenge um, in the global community, especially the scientific community. There's still, so if you're interested in doing research in the area of climate change, this is something that you can look at because we still don't understand fully the, the effect of climate change on metabolism or on organisms, the population of organisms. So in the ocean, increased metabolic rates due to rising temperatures will be accompanied by declines in dissolved the, the oxygen and potentially restricting organism aerobic cap capacities. So what this is saying is that in the ocean, increased uh, metabolic rates are really due to the rising in temperature. So because the temperature is so high, organisms are metabolizing at a much faster rate. And we soon get into what metabolism is. But if you know what metabolism is before we get there, you can drop the definition in the chat because we're getting there shortly. So, you know, and then because the metabolic, the metabolic rates are increasing, you know, this is accompanied by declines in dissolved oxygen. So the organisms are really struggling here to survive because they need oxygen in order to metabolize. All right, so I'm just going to pause here and probably ask, you know, if everything is going well, are we understanding, can I continue and stuff like that. Do I have the green light to continue? Do you have any questions, any comments? If I have the green light to continue, you can just drop in the chat, green, green, green. Yes, me said the green light. Green light, cool. All right, so metabolism. So an organism's metabolism is defined as the sum of all enzyme-driven chemical reactions within a cell. So let me break that down. An organism's metabolism is basically all the chemical reactions that happen in a cell that produces the energy for the organism to do what it needs to do to survive. The metabolism of marine organisms and communities is tightly linked with the ecosystem services they provide. 
So what that means is that in terms of ecosystem services, it's just that organisms in an ecosystem, they provide certain, so they serve a particular role in that organism, in, a, in, that, in that community in a sense. So how an organism is able to metabolize in terms of produce its energy so that it can go about its day-to-day -day functioning it directly affects the functioning of that ecosystem itself. So despite extensive evidence suggesting impacts on the metabolism and physiology of marine species by factors such as changing in oxygen concentration and ocean acidification, most studies on the impact of climate change are based on the effect of changes in temperature. Now, the fact that metabolism is an enzyme-driven chemical reaction, so we all know that enzymes are in our cells. Enzy enzymes are, are so important. Enzymes are known as proteins that basically help a reaction to occur, right? And because it is a protein, it is affected largely by temperature. Because you will always learn that temperature denatures protein. And if temperature denatures protein, that means temperature can denature an enzyme, right? And if temperature can denature an enzyme, that means, therefore, that any change in the temperature can affect a me an organism's metabolism because it is driven by enzymes, all right? It is a chemical reaction that happens within the cell and it is driven by enzymes, which is a protein, and that's affected by temperature. So it can be denatured. So the main reason for the focus on temperature as a key variable in metabolism is the acceleration of all chemical reactions, including cellular biochemical reactions with increasing temperature. So that's another fact. The fact that because metabolism is a biochemical reaction, temperature can actually increase the rate of metabolism. It is like, for example, let us say that we're boiling a water. We're boiling a pot of water, right? So picture the pot of water on the stove. And if we decide to increase the, the, the fire underneath the pot, what will happen to the, 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 the pot of water? What would we observe as scientists? Uh, when, when heat is um, being applied to, what, to the pot of water, the atoms be, will become more it will increase the kinetic energy between the atoms, the, the molecules right. of water, it will, it will boil. It will. Right. So it, it will start to boil up and, and you just see everything starting to happen much faster, right? All the reactions, the kinetic energy between the, the atoms and the molecules of the water starting to, to move about much quicker. And so basically you would have increased the boiling mechanism of the water in a sense. And so it's the same thing that happens um, with temperature and metabolism. So one, it can affect the, the enzyme and two, it can increase the rate of the reaction. So metabolism is actually an inefficient process and it produces heat. The reason why it's considered to be inefficient is because you eat so much food, because remember, um, so, the base, we're still going to the basic um, definition of metabolism as well. So you eat a lot of food, but you get so little energy from the food that you eat and it produces heat, right? And so that is why it is considered to be an inefficient process. Endotherms use metabolic heat and endotherms are actually, so you have endotherms and Ectotherms, right? So I'll explain the difference between these two. So endotherms, or do we know what the difference is? Anybody knows? 
No, first we're seeing the storm. It has to do with heat. Yes. Um, I think endo is when you absorb the heat in the environment and ex exo. Is that what you said? Then you exo, give off? exotherm. Oh, well, uh, endotherm. Hmm. Wait, doesn't that have to do with like warm blooded animals? Correct, definitely correct. So endotherms are like humans, for example, mammals. What happens is that endotherms, we have, we control our temperature on the inside. So we have, you know, our, our temperature is really internal. It's controlled by our, the different processes that happen inside our body. And so they say that we use metabolic heat to keep a stable body temperature, while ectotherms do not. Ectotherms, they don't, they don't have the ability to produce heat from the inside. So they have to adapt to whatever temperature it is on the outside, right? And so the baseline metabolic rate of an, org of an animal is measured as the basal metabolic rate for an endotherm or as a standard metabolic rate for an ectotherm. So the baseline metabolic rate really speaks to the minimum at which metabolism can, ha can happen, right? And it is very important because if it is that you're living in an, even in an environment where it is that it is completely below your baseline metabolic rate, it would therefore mean that you will not be able to survive in this environment. Right. And so what this is saying is that there are two terms here that you need to remember in terms of the fact that the baseline metabolic rate for an organism is measured as basal metabolic rate in the case of endotherms and in the case of ectotherms, they're measured as standard metabolic rates. All right. I'll share the slide for you so you can read over. Among endotherms, smaller animals tend to have a higher per gram basal metabolic rate, which means a hotter metabolism than larger animals. So what that means is that smaller, smaller animals tend to have a much higher temperature as their baseline metabolic rate. So let's say um, an organism's baseline metabolic rate is usually 25 degrees Celsius. And uh, for smaller animals, it would probably be 30, 35 degrees Celsius, right? And that means that smaller animals would be able to survive in much um, cooler or hotter temperatures than larger animals. So larger animals would probably stick to the 25 degrees Celsius, anything below that can affect them. All right? So metabolic rates vary with activity level. So more active animals have a higher metabolic rate than less active animals. Some animals enter a state of, so you guys know about hibernation. Are you familiar with hibernation? Yes. They're going when uh, animals sleep for a long time. Right. So these are times of rest. It's a long resting period, right? So at that time, their metabolism is extremely slow and lowered, basically. So they're not using up any energy at all. So just to understand the process of metabolism a bit more, it is that, you know, the molecule breakfast, once you eat it in terms of your breakfast, your lunch, or your dinner, those molecules basically in your, let's say you're eating bacon, egg, and bread, there are molecules in the bacon, egg, and bread that has energy stored in their chemical bonds. So once you eat it, your body's metabolic reactions um, basically break down this food to extract the energy from it, right? And then that energy is stored and captured as an 
adenosine triphosphate. Right, so that's a new word for, for anybody who's not familiar with ATP. So that is the, the, the term used to describe the state in which energy extracted from food after metabolism, it is stored in your body as ATP. And ATP means adenosine triphosphate. All right, so when, you, when you're eating the next time, you can say, wow, my body's getting some ATP. <laughs> it's getting some adenosine triphosphate, right? So once it is that you, you intake all of this food and the, your body break down the chemical bonds that are stored in the food and extract the energy, it stores it as adenosine triphosphate. When you start to work out and do a lot of things, you're using up the adenosine triphosphate, which is basically your energy or your ATP, all right? So this energy carrying molecule basically is used to power other met metabolic reactions that keeps your cells running. So throughout the day, you, there, you might not be eating all day throughout the day, right? So you just eat at breakfast time, lunch time, and dinner time. So while your body produces ATP at that time, it utilizes the ATP to power other metabolic reactions in your body to produce more energy, all right? And of course, we would have just went into depth in terms of um, how it can be stored. So molecules from food are also used as building blocks for the structures of your body. So for instance, proteins from your food are broken down into their component parts. So in your food, you have amino acids and, and other um, nutrients that may be used to build new proteins in your own cell. If you eat more than enough food to replenish the energy you use, food energy may also be stored as glycogen, which is a chain of linked glucose molecules, or as triglycerols, which is fat molecules. So, and usually when the food energy is stored as glycogen or triglycerols, it is usually stored and used for later. So that is why people get fat or that is how people end up getting fat because they eat more than enough food and the food now is stored as glycogen and triglycerols, which is the fat molecules stored for later use. Oftentimes fat people don't exercise and so the later use never comes. They, they never work it off. If you eat like a lot of calorie food. Yeah. Food with a lot of calorie. Right. But you have to ensure that you work it off and you, you, you definitely um, utilize up the energy stored. So some animals can use and regulate their metabolic heat production to maintain a relatively constant body temperature. <laughs> Especially in endotherms all right so some animals can use and regulate their metabolic heat to maintain a relatively constant body temperature these animals called endotherms include mammals such as humans and birds ectotherms on the other hand are animals that don't use metabolic heat production to maintain a constant body temperature Instead, their body temperature changes with the temperature of the environment. Examples of ectotherms are lizards and snakes. So if the place is cold, inside of the lizard is going to be cold as well. If the place is hot, inside of the lizard will be hot as well. This is why you always see lizards closer to the light bulb because why, why you think you always see them closer to the light bulb? are in corners. Anybody can guess? <laughs> okay, correct. That was Arico? Yes, yes. All right, so yeah, definitely for heat or for warmth. All right, so this will show you 
how it is that the outside temperature affects the body temperature of these organisms. So endotherms, like the mouse on, your, on, on this side of the slide, it will show you that it don't matter how the outside temperature increases, the body temperature of the mouse remains constant because internal operations that is happening inside of the mouse is working to ensure that a, an equilibrium or a balance is always kept. Ecno, ecno, ectotherms, sorry, <laughs> ectotherms like the snake here, it shows you that the outside temperature, once it is increasing, their body temperature will also increase. So the amount of energy expended by an animal over a specific period of time is called the metabolic rate, right? So this is just for definition purposes. This, so the metabolic rate, whenever we mention metabolic rate, we're talking about the amount of energy that an organism uses over a particular period of time, all right? Metabolic rates may be measured in joules, calories, or kilocalories per unit time. And this is very important for you to note. You may also see metabolic rate given as oxygen consumed or carbon dioxide produced per unit time. Who can tell me why it is that they, you know, scientifically, they can use the oxygen consumed or the carbon dioxide produced per unit time to calculate the metabolic rate? Think about it and let me know. Nobody? Say that again. Why would you be able to use oxygen consumed or the carbon dioxide produced per unit time to calculate the metabolic rate? Um, because you don't have a slow heart rate. Or you are warm. So the answer is really because whenever an organism, you remember that metabolic rate speaks to the amount of energy being used by an animal over a specific period of time. So once it is that you're doing any sort of activity, you always have to inhale or exhale, correct? And you do that at a particular rate based on the energy that you're utilizing. And so they're able to directly link the oxygen consumed or the carbon dioxide produced per unit time to give the metabolic rate. Was that clear? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. So oxygen is used up in cellular respiration and carbon dioxide is produced as a byproduct. So both of these measurements indicate how much fuel is burning. So this is just speaking to the baseline that we would have went over. So I'll just skip it. Um, and you can review once the slide is posted. And then it goes into more detail as it pertains to um, the basal metabolic rates of the different organisms comparing endotherms and ectotherms. All right, so I have a few questions here. Uh, we don't have to answer them immediately. We can go through them now very briefly. And um, because I believe Randy would have wanted the session to end at 12 so that you guys can meet to discuss your climate change campaign. So the- and I thought it was marine life. I thought it was marine life and plastics. Oh, you have marine life on plastics later? No, you. Don't. I don't think you have that today. So basically, um, well, before I go, I think I have, let me see if I have it here. All right, so I'm going to launch a poll and you guys can 
submit your responses. Miss, from what country are you from? Is that your birthplace or the place where you live? Uh, put the place where you live now. All right, so encouraging everyone to respond to the poll. All right, so I'm going to ask Tremaine to share the results. Um, 